It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible, still relevant in today's complex world. It is written, sharing messages of hope around the world. You know, there are many individuals who are left to wonder who their father or mother might be. For some, they were given up for adoption at an early age for a variety of reasons. And for others, a parent or both parents have died, leaving that child orphaned. For Marissa Thaman, that was the case. Her mother passed away from a pulmonary embolism when she was only three months old she would never have a conscious recollection of who her mother was. Now, Marissa's father, who took his role as a single father very seriously, later would meet a special woman by the name of Heather, and the two of them got married. Heather helped raise Marissa as if she were her own daughter. For 17 years, she paid that price that parents pay to show Marissa the ways of life. Yet during that time, she did not adopt Marissa because of the amount of money it would cost and the sizable amount of paperwork it would have taken. Yet Marissa and Heather were an inseparable duo that acted and functioned as any mother and daughter would. But on Christmas Day 2016, something amazing happened. As their family were opening presents, Heather opened a gift from Marissa it was a small ornament, and on that ornament were these words, Would you adopt me? Marissa had taken care of all the paperwork and what became a viral video, an international story. The entire family cried in the joy of moving forward in that process. You know how I told you Alyssa was doing it? We were doing it together. <laughs> I've been waiting for so long. <laughs> In touching words that Marissa wrote on a little note with the ornament, she said, You have been the best thing my dad has ever given me. Calling you my stepmom is almost insulting. Thank you for being the mom that I always needed. Not only could Heather legally adopt Marissa, but both desired it to be so. You know, friends, this is a beautiful reminder of what Jesus' desire for you and for me is. Do you desire it from him? That he would adopt you as his son or daughter. Jesus came to this earth with a distinct mission. His mission was one of redemption and adoption. Now, on today's program, I want to talk more about that redemption and adoption in the context of the great Star Wars battle. You see, Jesus' mission was more than to simply be born and then die. He had a mission of bringing peace and comfort and healing. He not only desired to save humanity, but he desired to adopt each of us as sons and daughters and then through his love heal us and redeem us. The first steps of Jesus' ministry demonstrate this desire through his very actions. The first eight chapters of John show us the care that Jesus has for the humanity and his desire to bring healing and redemption. In John 2, Jesus visited a wedding and provided an ample supply of the fresh juice of the vine saving the master of ceremonies and the newly married couple the social embarrassment it would have been to have run out. In John chapter 3, Jesus met Nicodemus under the shadows, saving Nicodemus the social pressures of publicly acknowledging Jesus as Lord and Savior, yet teaching him the essential nature of being born again. In John 4, Jesus visited Samaria and brought social, physical, and spiritual healing to the woman at the well. 
Now this was such a significant event, first because Jesus actually went to Samaria, a place the Jews thought of as unclean. In fact, in traveling from Judea to Galilee, although a straight line through Samaria was the fastest route, the Jews would circumvent Samaria and go all the way around to avoid actually even stepping on the ground of the Samaritans. Jews would have nothing to do with them. Yet Jesus went to Samaria to bring healing and redemption. The second reason this is so fascinating is because Jesus interacted with a forsaken woman. Jesus' care and love for each of us is so great that he will go to tremendous lengths to bring about healing and redemption. Then in John chapter 5, Jesus brought healing to the paralytic man, despite it being Sabbath and the Jews believing that it was against the law to heal on the Sabbath. Jesus fulfilled the true meaning of Sabbath through that healing and once again demonstrated his core desire of that healing and redemption. In John 6, Jesus fed the 5,000 to provide for both their physical and spiritual needs. And finally, in John chapter 8, an event that summarizes the entire ministry of Jesus and his desire for each of us, he healed the woman caught in adultery. Now, you might ask, how does that summarize what he wants to do for me when I haven't committed adultery? Well, let's examine exactly what Jesus did now, according to John 8 and beginning in verse 1, it records this event in the life of Jesus. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, early in the morning, he came again into the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst... They said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that she should be stoned. But what do you say? This they did, testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. Now I want to ask you to picture the moment in your mind. Jesus was teaching and then these religious leaders came and cast the woman before him. She was likely unclothed or with very little clothing. They had caught her in the act. Some commentators surmised that these leaders had actually set a trap for her and actually had committed adultery with her that they might make this accusation. You see, they were trying to trap Jesus. Would he uphold the law of Moses and have her stoned or would he break it? They believed that they had him in a corner in a catch-22 situation. But the Bible records that Jesus didn't answer them. But he crouched down and he began writing in the sand. They continued to ask him what he would do. Then he responded with these words, Let he who is without sin cast the first stone that he crouched again and kept writing in the sand. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what he wrote, but by the simple process of deduction, it helps us conclude that he was, in fact, writing the record of their sin in the sand. The Bible says that each one of them left one by one to save face, to save embarrassment. Then Jesus, with, I'm sure, soft words, asked, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? Now, many will say that they were all gone, and that is actually incorrect. There was only one that day that could have justly accused the woman, and that person was Jesus himself. Yet the Bible says he chose to not condemn her. And this is why the Bible records in verse 11, she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. See, Jesus desires to not only adopt us, but to bring healing and redemption 
for each and every one of us. He desires that we would experience the freeing effect of entering into a relationship with him. Now, by the way, not to be missed in all of this is the reality that he was also actually trying to reach a different group, those religious leaders as well. You see, the story records that Jesus wrote their sins in the ground, in the sand, not in stone. Later, the wind would blow away the record and he would try to bring healing actually to them. And later on in the book of Acts, we see that some of those very teachers, some of those very religious leaders who rejected Jesus gave their lives to him and became his disciples. You see, Jesus came to bring life, but the Bible records that there is another who has brought a message of death and destruction. John 10.10 10 says these words, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. As the devil has seen and heard the desires of Jesus, he has viciously attacked those that Jesus loves. First Peter tells us about these attacks of the devil. First Peter in chapter five and verse eight says these words. The devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But Jesus, Jesus wants to save us and free us from these attacks of Satan. Jesus lived a life of service. He was and is the savior of the world. He did so many great and powerful and good things all because his desire is to adopt you and to redeem you. And this is why the apostle Paul, as recorded in his letter to the Romans in chapter three and beginning in verse 21, wrote these words. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Did you hear that? All of us are sinners who have fallen short of the glory of God, yet Jesus wants to be the justifier of you and the surety of your salvation. And Romans 5 and verse 9 tells us very clearly, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. His desire is for your adoption, redemption, and salvation. And it is so great that he died before you ever made a decision to come to him. I want you to think for just a moment. Think about Jesus as he was closing out his ministry. Think of him as he stepped into the Garden of Gethsemane and he prepared for those final acts of his earthly mission. There as he entered the garden, the sins of the world were placed upon him. One of my favorite books on the life of Christ, The Desire of Ages, says this. But now, he seemed to be shut out from the light of God's sustaining presence. Now he was numbered with the transgressors. The guilt of fallen humanity he must bear. Upon him who knew no sin must be laid the iniquity of us all. So dreadful does sin appear to him. So great is the weight of guilt which he must bear that he is tempted to fear it will shut him out forever from his father's love. Feeling how terrible is the wrath of God against transgression, he exclaims, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Come back with me to that garden 
There while Jesus was anguished and feeling the separation from the Father, the serpent, the devil, lurked in the background, trying to dissuade him from going through with it all. And the book Desire of Ages continues, as Christ felt his unity with the Father broken up, he feared that in his human nature, he would be unable to endure the coming conflict with the powers of darkness. In the wilderness of temptation, the destiny of the human race had been at stake. Christ was then conqueror. Now the tempter had come for the last fearful struggle. For this he had been preparing during the three years of Christ's ministry. Everything was at stake with him. If he failed here, his hope of mastery was lost. The kingdoms of the world would finally become Christ's. He himself would be overthrown and cast out. But if Christ could be overcome, the earth would become Satan's kingdom and the human race would be forever in his power. With the issues of the conflict before him, Christ's soul was filled with dread of separation from God. Satan told him that if he became the surety for a sinful world, the separation would be eternal. He would be identified with Satan's kingdom and would never more be one with God. At Christ's weakest point, at his darkest hour, Satan strikes back at Jesus with vengeance. He lashes out with an intense attack, and the passage then continues. The people who claim to be above all others in temporal and spiritual advantages have rejected you. They are seeking to destroy you. The foundation, the center, and seal of promises made to them as a peculiar people. One of your own disciples who has listened to your instruction and has been among the foremost in the church activities will betray you. One of your most zealous followers will deny you. All will forsake you. Christ's whole being abhorred the thought that those whom he had undertaken to save, those whom he loved so much, should unite in the plots of Satan. This pierced his soul. The conflict was terrible. Its measure was the guilt of his nation, of his accusers and betrayer, the guilt of a world lying in wickedness. The sins of men weighed heavily upon Christ, and the sense of God's wrath against sin was crushing out his life. We each know the rest of the story. Jesus was arrested, he was illegally tried, and then Satan would stir the crowd, and they crucified the Savior of the world. His disciples thought it was all lost. I imagine that all of the heavenly realms were shocked by the actions of that fallen angel. It would seem that Satan had struck back with a most devastating blow that he, in fact, had killed the Son of God. For three days, they would wonder. They had forgotten about the promises of Jesus. But as we know, early that Sunday morning, as Matthew 28, 2 records, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. In the midst of the greatest blow struck by the enemy of all good, it was Jesus who would conquer the grave and rise again. Although Satan had struck, Jesus conquered the grave and defeated Satan. And here it is. This is what it means for you and me. Romans 3.21 tells us, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. Righteousness is not found in the law. The word righteousness carries with it the idea that it is a divine act of God making a person right before him. It also carries with it the idea of right living or right doing while being right with God. 
Paul emphasizes the point that righteousness cannot be found in the law of God. Rather, the righteousness of God is found in faith and in the promises of God. The passage, though, continues in verse 23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned and fallen short. This word sin, as you can see, is in the past tense. However, in the Greek, it conveys the idea that it's on a continual basis. It says that, yes, we have sinned in the past, but we continually sin and fall short of that glory of God. And it conveys with it the idea that sin is more than simply an action, but rather it is a part of our very nature. Our nature must be overcome. Our nature must be transformed. Now, don't misunderstand. This is not an excuse to keep sinning, yet it conveys that it is a part of our very nature, which we cannot change on our own or by our own power. But the passage promises how we can be changed. Verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Justification is made available through redemption. Justification is the action of God saving us from our past life. It is that adoption that we have discussed. How is it that Jesus can make that claim upon us through redemption. The word redemption literally means the releasing by payment of ransom. While the word justification is literally to be declared righteous before God, Jesus Christ through his sacrifice on the cross has released us from the penalty of sin by purchasing our ransom and adopting us as sons and daughters that we might stand justified before God. Yet that is not all that Jesus has done. The Bible says that he's also our propitiation. Now, if you're reading for a more modern version, it says that he is our atonement. Literally, this word means to be made right with God. And splitting that word atonement into parts, at one meant. Jesus bridged the chasm that exists between us and God. Jesus Christ is the sacrifice, and by his death, he has met the blood sacrifice requirement of sin. His death, which was the experience of the second death, fulfilled the price that was required to be paid. Lastly, and most importantly, the text promises that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You see, faith in Jesus, belief in Jesus, that's all that God asks. All of this is available through faith. And friends, faith is a choice. It is free will. God won't force it upon you. And today Jesus cries out to you. He cries out to me. He cries out to everyone to accept that promise. The serpent, the devil, lashed out against God's plan and killed Jesus, and now he lashes out against you and me. But we must not fear. 1 Peter 5, 8 to 10 makes this marvelous promise. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Friends, we must understand that Jesus is working toward our salvation. He has made the provision for our salvation. Yet in order for us to fully experience the joy of that salvation, we must accept it by faith. By faith, we must make the choice to enjoy the salvation of God. Friend, do you want to experience that salvation today? Do you want to have the assurance of your justification and your redemption from sin? I would invite you today, by faith, to reach out your hand, clasp the hand of Jesus, and accept his plan for your life. Heavenly Father, 
There may be some who are watching today who are hearing for the first time the promise of the gospel message. For that individual, I want to pray for them that by faith they would accept your promise, that they would be adopted as a son or a daughter, that they would come to you and enjoy life eternal. For others who are listening today, they accepted this promise of salvation some time ago. I would pray that they today would renew that decision that they've made, that they would lay all things aside, come to you, give their lives to you, and be committed to you until your son Jesus comes again in glory. Please, Lord, keep us for that day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My dear friends, in the great cosmic battle, Star Wars, between Christ and Satan, the Bible is clear. Jesus is the victor. And here's the amazing thing. He wants to be your father. He wants to adopt you as a son or daughter and be that perfect father. If you'd like to get more information and resources to grow in your spiritual life, I want to invite you to go to our website, itiswrittencanada.ca. You can also follow us on Facebook and there receive an occasional special quote to inspire you for the day. Friend, I hope that today's program was a blessing. I invite you to join us again next week. Until then, remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Thank you.